Hello, I'm back with Professor Larry Cotter Backer to discuss his book, Hong Kong Between One Country and Two Systems. Today we were discussing chapter 14, Two Systems, Internationalism Against One Country, Nationalism, Reflections of the G7 Declaration, and the Reconstruction of a New Era, written on September 2nd, 2019. How are you doing today, Professor Backer? Oh, I'm doing very well. Thank you. In fact, I'm wearing a prop today. So I figured given the, the nature of this chapter, I would wear my uh, bright orange danger hazard uh, shirt, uh, which kind of aligns with the, the theme of the chapter. The whole book seems like a hazard. <laughs> well, yeah, but this is this is one of these, we got a blinking yellow light now, blinking amber yeah. light. So that's why I got this. It's either that or I'm, I'm working the streets during the summer and I need to make sure you don't run me over. You look Either like a traffic cone. They're, they're both good metaphors for the chapter. You look like a traffic cone, but it's nice to see you. Um, so <laughs> when this chapter, before we get started, I just give you some of my reflections on it. And I'd say, you know, in this chapter, I started to see another transition where before we were talking about meaning making. And, and now we're talking about two different meanings or or a speech that's being lost in translation between two separate parties. And so I guess the first um, uh, the, the, the avenue that we're gonna talk about is through the group of seven, the G7, and their, um, their statement. So what did you talk about in this chapter uh, while reflecting on their statement? Well, you know, you, you really summed it up. I, I, it's, it, with, with what you just said, we can almost say, well, the interview's over, we're done. Um, but I'm going <laughs> to, because I mean, you hit the nail on the head, but let me elaborate. Yeah, we have been, in a sense, making meaning. And the, the first 13 chapters has, in a way, you didn't realize it until you get to the end of August. But we've been involved in, in extraordinary meaning making operations, mostly by the central authorities, for the most part, to some extent. In its, in its discourse, in traditional abstract discourse, and then using the bodies of the protesters, which is a different discursive technique, but again, also meant to be making meaning on the ground in Hong Kong. Um, there's been an illusion in the last couple of chapters, we started talking about the foreigners, but now finally, this last element comes in, and it's the last element that comes in and what makes it interesting is that we finally begin to see now the third leg of our cauldron, right? The third leg, which is the international element, not the black hand of foreign interference from the perspective of the international community, but they're going to bring back a very different sense of meaning of the events and the documents that memorialize and structured that meaning in ways that do not align with the way that the central authorities were constructing their own meaning. And this crystallizes um, with the, the G7 statement uh, at the beginning of September. And really, for me, it, it, uh, it was a, a moment of significant clarity and perhaps a moment where the character of the protest now changes. Uh, we move from the performance of the, you know, now I'm going to use a Leninist term, although the central authorities rejected this, they might, they might uh, in a different era have considered it. We move from the expression of mass sentiment um, in, as part of the mass line, the mass sentiment of the body of the people, right? And it's rejection or it's remaking by the Chinese central and then local authorities to one in which the international community comes in and says, oh, wait, when we're talking about one country, two systems, we're not talking about something that is, was, or started as something internal to China, but that indeed Hong Kong, its condition, its oversight and the constraints that are meant to be placed within the two systems part and therefore a constraint on the one country part of the one country, two systems is really part of international law 
then dot, 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 and we're going to see this um, clearly emerge by the beginning of 2020, uh, international norms as well, international law and international norms. So that Hong Kong is an international issue, its constitution, irrespective of a near universal, I say near universal because we got what, five or six billion people on earth, there's someone who's going to disagree. But other than the couple of people who will, near universal consensus that Hong Kong is part of the sovereign territory of China. Now the international community comes in and says, yeah, that's true. There's territorial sovereignty, but the constitution and exercise of that sovereignty within the space of Hong Kong is of a different character given the nature of its of the repatriation, the reseeding of parts of Hong Kong, and of course the lapse of the lease for the other part uh, in the context of its return. <clears throat> and all of this, of course, then, um, how shall I say, <laughs> um, not making the Chinese central authorities very happy and indeed um, creating substantial incentives for them to renew and I, to not only renew, but to further develop statements and ideas and positions that had been already being pronounced, although ignored in the West, they figured if they could pretend not to hear it, it would go away in 2017 and 2018. So that's, that's essentially what's going on. And looking at this, one begins to see here more clearly how in the context of meaning making, one can really see how differently the three key actors in this drama see the world and are capable of understanding. And, and that was gonna be what I led into with my next question. I was gonna ask were these discursive arguments, uh, I guess promoted by the groups of protesters themselves, um, were, were they able to act as a uh, megaphone for the international community or did they just have totally separate messaging boards that did not really align, uh, I guess you'd say, with the views of the international community at all. Right. Well, definitively, the jury's out. Okay. And the jury's out. It's, it's, it's not clear that we have enough information. I'm waiting for the PhD student who has probably not yet been born, who will one day have access to archives that will be open, who can then definitively answer that question. Um, for our purposes, it's not really necessary because we know enough to know a couple of things from which we can make surmises. One of the things we know is that the central authority um, in China speaks with a single voice. The international community speaks with multiple voices, but we clearly know what they are, who they are, and they tend to more or less align. The protesters, on the other hand, is not very clear, right? There's this constellation. We've talked about this before. There's a constellation of protesters. They're in alliance. They're not in alliance. They're working autonomously. They're not working autonomously. You have uh, groups that may, whose of views and tactics may be completely incompatible. Within all of this, of course, it's clear that there are probably some alignments between some members of the protesting community and some elements of the international community, just as there may be between some of the leadership people in Hong Kong, right, and others, part of the, the people who weren't protesting in Hong Kong and the local or central authorities who then in that alignment would then echo, right, or, um, or coordinate the statements, ideas, and expressions that they make um, with the, the people with whom they're aligned. So yeah, it is, it, and, and we see this later on with some of the more prominent, at least in the West, some of the more prominent leaders of the of portions of the, the protest movement uh, going in and out and, and hanging out with uh, some of the, the US diplomats and diplomats from other people. Uh, but you also see it uh, with uh, other Hong Kong people who may or may not have been protesting or who may or may not be aligned with local authorities, um, also engaging in fence building uh, in their own ways. So to some extent, there's that. 
But to some extent, and, and for me, and, and I think chapter 14 makes this clear, um, it's still clearly discernible that at their core, they may be related, but they're certainly not merged. They're very, dis they're, they're different. Okay, so how did, um, I guess you say in response to this uh, statement, was there a raising of an alarm within the central government? Uh, was it something that was predictable or was it something that more so could be used uh, like, like other incidences with, where you saw um, meetings between protesters and government officials in America? What, what was it used to their advantage? Right. I, and, yeah, I mean, you hit, again, you hit the nail on the head. Um, I think it's door number three. Uh, this, the G7 statement inadvertently, I think, uh, because it's not clear to me that, well, never mind, I'll keep my, my views about the G7 and its structure to myself for the, for the moment. But it's clear that whether intended or not, the G7 provided an extraordinarily potent opportunity for the Chinese central authorities now, not only to further develop their own view of the internationalism at the heart of one country, two systems, and um, an internationalism which is absolutely incompatible with and completely at odds with what is being cobbled together outside of, of China, right? But, and this is the opportunistic part, they provided China with a platform from which they could project their views, which had been relatively underreported and for most people just too esoteric to worry about. I mean, you start saying the word sovereignty, what sovereignty is three or four syllables, depending on where you learn to pronounce words. Yeah, who cares, right? Now all of a sudden, ah, okay, this is interesting, and now people are going to listen. Uh, and so, and the central authorities took advantage of that. And, and they took advantage of that, I think, in a, um, a particularly potent way. Uh, and in a way, much more potent than the, the sort of anemic statement that came out of the, the G7. And by anemic, I mean, the statement was um, given the context in which the statement was made, the statement was ambiguously vague enough to permit the parties to it to treat it as a null set, that is, as something with no meaning in the context of meaning giving rise to obligation or responsibility to do something. And said the opposite was true. All it did was provide a statement from which some people or some states might have viewed from out of it a consequential duty or responsibility to act, but others could just kick back. And, and recall, we've seen this before, right? We started the book with chapter one with that kind of statement. Lovely in a sense, but ultimately either a lament or, or in this case, uh, sort of blend. And, and again, notice the G7 reaffirms existence and importance of the Sino-British Joint Declaration of 1984 on Hong Kong. So notice what they're doing. They are reaffirming the existence. Well, the central authorities can also agree with that. Yeah, it, it exists. We were there, we signed it, uh, and there's a record of it, right? And the importance, yeah, it was important it was important. This is what the central authorities would say, not what the G7 would say, but okay, fine. So they reaffirm existence and importance of a document that was crafted in 1984, which served as a basis in part, although that there'll be debate about that as well. I'm not gonna get into that. Um, uh, it, uh, about the Sino-British Joint Declaration. And then what do they do? They call for violence to be avoided. Right, well, of course, now who's being violent? That is part of the discursive battle, right? Between the protesters on the one side and the, the Hong Kong authorities on the other, with the Hong Kong authorities saying, look, 
It's the protesters who are by their very actions being violent. And therefore, what we are doing is restoring order. And we may have to get physical about it. What the protesters say is the opposite. No, we are exercising our rights, the interference of which creates an unacceptable level of violence on our bodies, which is the, the way in which we're expressing our politics. Right, but the G7 statement kind of goes to both views. They remain agnostic when that was probably from a political perspective, the last thing on earth they needed to be. Um, and they limit themselves to identifying a document and to reaffirming existence and importance. Okay, um, I, can, uh, I can do that as well uh, to everything from the, uh, the list of projects that I have to do tomorrow uh, to uh, the, the um, uh, recognition of, a, uh, of my Bachelor of Arts degree that I got and recognize its importance uh, and its existence. I, okay, you know, thank you um, for uh, at very great expense to the, the, the purses of all of these seven countries. Thank you for taking these jets, cars, automobiles, and trains going in very expensive and posh surroundings, um, you know, surrounded by very expensive surveillance and police protection so that you can produce, I'm going to use an 18th century literary um, uh, expression, so that you could produce bathos. Bathos is moving up to an anticlimax. Right. And yet, and yet, and yet, even this is enough to irritate the, uh, the Chinese central authorities enough for them to then come out with their own view, right? Uh, and, and you can read the chapter and, and watch how these things are, are developing. Yeah, I, and that's, that's all you can do is get people to read the chapter so that they can understand better what you're discussing right now. That's right. We're, all just, we're all just teasing you all so that you can, you can actually put a crowbar to your wallet, buy the book. <laughs> well, I think that those three answers um, really did delve pretty deeply into the chapter. Uh, all right, let me emphasize one, one thing before you, you, you hit me with the, the next question. Um, in that, and I know I've been I've been horribly cruel to the the G7 statement. Um, it, it was just it's, uh, it was just too tempting, um, and I was less horribly cruel on paper. Um, and and yes, I'm sure that a core of diplomats from seven leading countries in the world would be able over the course of six months to explain to me a thousand different ways why they thought one, they had no choice and two, this is the best thing that they could do under the circumstances, blah, 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 um, and uh, color me unconvinced um, because what is really going on is everything that they can't explain um, that produce this, this bathotic uh, statement. But what becomes important here is the divergence that it shows. So for the G7, the information is that the document itself remains international, a central element in the ordering of and the duties and responsibilities of states, including sovereign states, to the construction and maintenance of the system that it was meant to describe, the one country, two systems, and that therefore two systems becomes as much a part of international expectations mm -hmm. in terms of its operation um, as it is a domestic responsibility of the central authorities, irrespective of the fact that everyone who would say that would sign off on Chinese territorial sovereignty, uncontested territorial sovereignty of the, of the space. The Chinese, on the other hand, would say, no, it is not a living document in the sense that it is still constitutionally relevant as a sovereignty managing document, managing not just within the country, but outside of the country. But instead, it is a historical document, the 
primary purpose of which was to affect mm -hmm. in a peaceful and orderly way the end of the lease for a chunk of what was the crown colony, right? That was leased at the end of the 19th century, more or less, right? And there were a number of leases and to reseed, because remember uh, it was the imperial government that had ceded part of what was uh, the crown colony in the first place, the way large chunks of territory were over the course of a millennia or two ceded uh, to the, the various dynasties in China to create what um, the, the current government views as the extent of its territory. Well, this was ceded away, just as you can see too, you can cede away and this was ceded away. Yes, the circumstances were horrible, but then from the losing side during the, the um, prior dynasties that augmented the, the size of uh, Chinese territory, it was horrible. Uh, and probably not, and, and probably very tragic for those who wound up doing the seating. I mean, that's that's just the way it goes. Um, as much as we find that distasteful in 2021, uh, much less so uh, in the millenniums uh, before, right? But so they they seeded it, and the UK then seeded it back. Until that moment came, technically. I guess the UK could have held on as its own sovereign space, a little itty bitty bit of what would have been the, the colony, but clearly that was impossible, which is what caused all of this to begin with um, and the, the thinking of the Thatcher government uh, and ultimately this thing. But there were two things involved, the, the lease and the seating, right? And that the document, all the document did was provide an orderly mechanism for both of that to happen so that at the end of the process in the 1990s, all of it now reseeded or with a lease expiry now goes back to China um, from the Chinese perspective. And having done that, the Chinese government, uh, the Chinese uh, authorities would say, the document has ceased to have any relevance at all. The two systems um, portion of Hong Kong local or regional constitutionalism becomes embedded in the greater national constitutional project of China as a sovereign singularity, and you're done, right? And for the international community, of course, here is the first very tentative effort to provide a very different view. Now, over the course of the next um, nine months, it's the central authorities who work much harder to articulate their views and to elaborate it in a more consistent and elegant way than the uh, multilateral um, organizations like the G7 or the states that make it up did uh, from this point forward. The, the West goes farther than this eventually, but not really too far and, and in a very different way. Um, the, the Chinese, um, as, as they say in a political context, stays on message. And, no, go ahead. No, no, you finish, you can finish. No, 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 and, and, and that is the, in, in a sense, the critical insight here. Uh, the detail is of course in, in the chapter, but that's, that's a critical insight that then becomes more and more pronounced Right, as we move forward after the beginning of September. And so with the final question, don't have to answer this right now, I was gonna use this more so for foreshadowing. Is this a point in which this message was a catalyst for more action? Because from my reading and understanding of the book, and I don't wanna to give too much of it away, but it seemed at this point in time, a lot of uh, the, uh, the things that occurred um, were more so words and and uh, discursive arguments, but in the future we go to closer towards actions. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. It's a little more complicated than that, but stay okay. tuned. Okay. Well, that is all that I have for this chapter. If you are satisfied, uh, have you 
Do you have more to do? You squeeze way too much out of me. This is this is great, and I enjoy I, I enjoy talking through the the chapters um, with you on this. I'm done, and I'm looking forward to talking about uh, chapter fifteen. Which all right, gonna... that sounds good, and I look forward to talking about chapter fifteen with you as well. Um, and for everyone out there, please go buy the book. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right. All right. See.